Good afternoon, a very warm welcome to our service where we gather together to, rem to remember and to celebrate Craig's life. As Craig's family sat down to organize this funeral service, it quickly became very evident uh, that Jones and Craig's own church, St. Nicholas Church in Presswick, wasn't going to be able to accommodate the number of folk who would, were expected, as it was limited to something like 400. So it's here in the Princess Royal Suite today. We have hundreds of folk who have traveled from all corners of the civilized globe to pay their own tribute to a man whom they held in high esteem, and others who are sharing online. From the world of football, managers and players and fans, from the sphere of education, lecturers, teachers, and former students. A whole gamut of Scottish society is represented. And how touched Joan and family are, not only by the amount of cards and letters that have arrived at the house at Pow Mill, but also by the fact that so many have taken time out of their diary to be here today. With them, as they remember, Craig as a husband, a father, a grandfather, a brother, an uncle, a worldwide constituency of family and friends. Craig, the high-profile public figure, and Craig, the man who was always loved within the four walls of that place he called home. Of course, there is a temptation on such a day to paint a word picture of the one whom we honor and make him out to be a, some sort of plaster cast saint. Truth can often be swamped by sentimentality and reality by emotion. Like every one of us in this room, he had his faults, his foibles and failings, but those certainly do not define him. He was a tough, take-no-prisoners football manager, a person with a rare ability to get alongside folk of all ages and stages, as well as a great sense of fun. He was someone who was a people person. He had time for people. He was generous with his time. He was generous in oh so many different ways. He was easy to know and easy to get along with. He was funny. He was humorous. The stories that he told were captivating. So we gather today to remember and to celebrate his life. But this is part of a, a Christian worship. Later on, um, we'll be able to hear from Val and Hugh and John as they speak about their dad and share some of the anecdotes that they have with us. It means the world to the family that you are now joining with them in an act of Christian worship and in gratitude to God for a life of rich talent and stellar service. Here, each of you can reflect and with smiles remember so many occasions when Craig brought delight and pride into your lives. And so we worship God. And we sing together, we stand to sing our first hymn, One More Step Along the World I Go.
two readings this, this afternoon. The first is from the book of Psalms in Psalm 39. And it says, show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath, even those who seem secure. Surely everyone goes around like a mere phantom. In vain they rush about, heaping up wealth, without knowing whose it will finally be. But now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. Save me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of fools. I was silent. I would not open my mouth, for you are the one who has done this. <coughs> Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cry for help. Be not deaf to my weeping, for I dwell with you as a stranger, as all my ancestors were. I often read this at a funeral, just to remind us of the shortness and the brevity of life. And for all of us, we are here only for a short time and a brief season. And I feel that the psalmist is seeking to remind us of that. But then there's hope. When we read in John's Gospel, where Jesus speaks to his followers, those who put their trust in Jesus. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. Amen. And may God add his blessing to this reading of his word. And to his name be the praise and the glory. Life is short. Eternity is long. And our way to get to eternity is through Jesus Christ, to put our trust in him. And I know that Craig had a faith, that he was someone who was part of the family and household of faith. He was a member of the church. And we trust that he is in God's nearer presence. Now a word of prayer together. Let us pray. Lord God, the feelings here are many, and the feelings here are varied. The emotions are too many for us to find words for them all. From every part of these islands and from further afield, we have made our way here to recall a unique person who has crossed our paths at various times in our lives. Some of us worked beside him. Others knew him as a significant figure in the world of football. Many shared his friendship. All of us want to ask you, to bless the legacy of the family he leaves, the people he nurtured. Merciful Father, this life is so uncertain. Give us all today the grace to number our days, filling each moment with purpose and value, with gladness and laughter, and standing for what is right and good. Help us to cherish the gifts that come each new day. Through him, who spent his days showing love and compassion, mercy and grace to all who crossed his path, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we are going to hear from Katie. Katie, um, one of Craig's granddaughters, is going to come and sing Arms of an Angel.
granddad would be so proud of you. Now we come to hear from the, some of the, the, the family. And first of all, I'm going to invite Val, Valerie, to come forward and to speak about that. James Craig Brown. Craig, dad, was born in Glasgow on the 1st of July, 1940, to Hugh and Margaret, the eldest in a family of three brothers with Bob and Jock. He was educated at Troon Primary, Burnside Primary, and St. John's Primary in Hamilton, before moving on to Hamilton Academy. In addition to dad's academic achievements, he was school captain and he was actively involved in various aspects of the school's life. His sporting prowess shone, particularly in football and golf. After leaving school, he studied at Jordan Hill to become a PE teacher and he gained an additional qualification in primary school teaching alongside playing football at Rangers, Dundee and Falkirk. Strangely, Dad was very proud of having a hit single as one of five Dundee FC players who formed the famous pop group Hammy and the Hamsters. With their hits, She Was Mine and My Dream Came True, I'm told they were the best boy band this side of Broughty Ferry. Another lesser known fact about Dad was that while he was a PE student, he moonlighted by appearing on television as part of a group of dancers for STV's Jig Time show. He married Joan, his childhood sweetheart, in 1964, and they lived in Hamilton while Dad taught in Lanarkshire schools, such as High Blantyre Primary and Belvedere Primary at Bells Hill. Mum and Dad were blessed with the arrival of Hugh in 1966 and John in 1968. The Browns moved to Prestwick in 1969 when Dad became a lecturer in primary education and PE at Craigie College of Education here in Ayr. The blue-eyed girl here completed the family in 1972. Meanwhile, Dad continued to broaden his own education by taking an open university degree in the mid-70s and co-writing a book called Activity Methods in the Middle Years with his Craigie College colleague, Tom Gregg. With his football playing career, curtailed by serious injury in his mid-twenties, Dad became very active in the world of coaching. His football career has been well documented, beginning as assistant to Willie McLean at Motherwell FC, thereafter to Clyde FC, the SFA, Preston North End, short spells at Derby County as football consultant, and Fulham as international scout, followed by management roles back at Motherwell and finally at Aberdeen FC. During his time in management, Dad was recognised for his services to international football by Queen Elizabeth II, who presented him the CBE medal at Buckingham Palace in 1999. Following his retirement of manager, as manager of Aberdeen FC in 2013, Dad was delighted to be appointed a director of the club which meant so much to him. Most recently, he was an ambassador for Aberdeen FC, a role which he cherished. What is perhaps less widely known is that he was vice president of the Alliance of European Football Coaches Associations, patron of Scottish Disability Sport, and patron of Walking Football Scotland. He was an active supporter of many grassroots football initiatives, including the Aberdeen Community Trust, Football Memories, and Sports Chaplaincy Scotland. 
Dad was consulted by countless managers, coaches, and players who recognized they could benefit from his knowledge and expertise of the game, as well as his network of contacts worldwide. He was a regular guest presenter for football associations across Europe on their pro license courses. He loved sharing his experience and he did so generously over the years. One of Dad's proudest achievements was being grandfather, Papa, to his six grandchildren. Katie, Craig, Scott, Freya, Lucy and Robbie. Each of them had a special bond with him. He enjoyed spending time with his grandchildren, particularly on our precious family holidays where he took the role of the shark in the swimming pool. The tributes spoken and written since Dad's death rightly recognise his huge contribution to Scottish football, as well as his intelligence, warmth, humility, and of course, his cheerful personality. He loved fun. The last three years weren't easy for Dad or the family. He survived miraculously a AAA operation for a ruptured aneurysm in September 2020. Gradually, signs began to appear that his general health was in decline. In October last year, Dad was diagnosed to be suffering from bladder cancer. Initially, it was thought that the treatment had been successful, but it wasn't so. He died peacefully at Air Hospital with the family at his bedside on Monday the 26th of June. The care he received from all the NHS professionals throughout his illness was exceptional and we are very grateful. Dad, as many of you will know, loved quoting statistics about football teams, football players, football matches. He was much more modest about his personal achievements. As a family, we teased him about his honorary doctorates and being double Dr. Brown. However, for the humble Craig, his favorite way of referring to himself was always as the ex-Clyde manager. James Craig Brown, CBE, D Arts, D Uni, B Ed Ons, BA, my dad, the best. Well done, Val. Not an easy task. But now I'm going to call upon the boys, and they are going to come and give their thoughts and reflections. I've no idea who Valerie was talking about there. <laughs> Difficult to recognise. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thanks to Val. Thank you again for the incredible love and support that has been overwhelming and heartwarming. As most of us have heard or read many of Dad's career highlights and football stories, I'm going to try and share a more personal insight. Because my dad has already given us his full repertoire of stories and anecdotes time and time again. Like that Archie was in charge of defending when Motherwell lost six at home to Hibs. <laughs> Following the, the many glowing tributes we have seen and received, I feel compelled to give you this balanced perspective. Because only three of us in this room have had to wash cars and weed the garden aged eight before being allowed out to play with our pals. And only two of us have had a thick ear, that's a polite way I put it, for smashing greenhouses and neighbours' windows with balls of all sizes. And up until the age of 12, I was going to play for Man United. 
or at least Ayr or Kelly. <laughs> but having seen one game, one game, however, a pragmatic dad confirmed at the breakfast table that that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> and I should stick in at school. <laughs> and badminton and golf. I, I was absolutely shattered and not sure I still recovered from that, but of course, as usual, he was correct. It was tough love. I think it would be fair to say that we endured old school discipline at home. So in all honesty, we were absolutely delighted when he decanted to his beloved Largs for the summer leaving mum and the three of us to go on with it. It wasn't the location particularly, it was his peer group who are here in force today and the camaraderie which he loved. We didn't have fancy foreign holidays as kids, but we had good manners drummed into us. John's forgotten some. Good grammar was very important. But we got the best sports equipment, boots, rackets, clubs. So I believe it was quite a unique upbringing, which is no surprise, given that the head of the family was James Craig Brown, a man without a large portfolio of interests, but compulsive in three areas. Education, behaviours and sport. But he knew he haw else. <laughs> this was a man who McCoyst and Macaulay will remember had no idea who Kylie Minogue was, or Dirty Den for that matter. A man who never watched a movie, or in fact anything other than sports news, cricket, tennis, golf, and of course, football. He was a football fanatic who couldn't cook, wash, iron, or do anything domestically. And he struggled to relax, really, until later in life. But a wonderful man. Most people get a good write-up when they pass away. So much so that it can be difficult to recognize the person. I do believe, though, that Dad was something special. He was an incredibly talented human being. A tough act to follow. I'll touch on that in a minute. He was a tremendous raconteur who did his stuff and made lasting friendships all over the world. He loved people and he loved to laugh gradually getting his laughs closer to home as he got older, as nothing, nothing would stop him attending his weekly coffee meetings with the boys in Ayr and in Aberdeen. Thank you, gentlemen. He loved you and he loved the banter. As Valerie said, he was struggling health-wise for the last couple of years. But he still described himself as fit enough for the bench. Because he was as tough as old boots. And he hated signs of weakness. And I'm sure former players and colleagues will confirm that minor injuries, well, they weren't acceptable. In fact, he himself remained half deaf recently because actually wearing his hearing aid would have indicated that he had a weakness. He was a supremely talented hard act to follow because very few people make it to the last eight of the Scottish boys at North Berwick, losing on the Friday morning before captaining the Scottish school boys football team on a Saturday. I'm not sure what would have happened had he got through to the Saturday, but my guess is He'd have played football. And his party trick, the Largs guys will, will know that his party trick was 
performing handstands and walking on his hands. So I realized many years ago that he must have been very, very disappointed in his offspring because none of us can do a handstand or play sport, any sport, to his level. This he confirmed many times over the years as he waxed lyrical about his six talented grandchildren to anyone he met, proclaiming time and time again that talent, son, misses a generation. <laughs> and again. He didn't even pretend that, that John and I were handsome. Val was always his wee bonnie, though. If I was with him and he introduced me to somebody, it was always with the familiar line, I have a good-looking son as well, you know. <laughs> Thankfully, he did the same when introducing John. <laughs> One-liners. One-liners were a particular speciality, as most of you know, most of which I can't repeat now, but... I always chuckled when he was asked, for example, what, what makes you think you can park in that parking space? And he would reply, I've told you, because I'm the ex-Clyde manager. <laughs> and one I always thought was sprinkled with his self-deprecating humour was during a visit to the golf driving range a few years ago. There's something wrong with this driver, HB. As it only went 133 yards, I used to hit an 8 iron to the third at Hamilton, and that's 133 yards. I said, Dad, you're not, you're not, you're, you're not 30, you're 80. Yeah, but the driver's still useless. <laughs> Raging. So you will appreciate that it has been tough uh, following Craig Brown and all his talent and his humour and humility. But I have learned so much over the years. And more recently, as we travelled regularly to games, often to watch young Craig playing, I now know fascinating things. <coughs> Some of which are of no use to me at this stage in my life or in my line of work. Like where the best place is to stop for a pee on the A90. <laughs> but that's getting increasingly useful. And where to stop for cakes and biscuits and sweets on the same route. And, interestingly, how to take and retain possession at a throw-in. I've had that on repeat. Dad would go crazy at the top-level teams who couldn't keep possession with a throw-in. It would astonish and frustrate him. They clearly never practice, they just launch it up the line usually losing possession. I could, and I did, coach 16-year-olds to do that better. Oh, and how to defend a corner. And how many players should be up at the halfway line when defending a corner? There was heated debate in our house about that one. Because John would play devil's advocate and tell him that some top coaches leave one or two up, knowing that Dad favoured everybody back. It's harder to score in a busy box, JB. It's all about opinions, of course. And I should probably wrap this up now, but if my dad was here, we would have another giggle about the time as teenagers that John and I joined in a chorus of Brown must go with the Clyde supporters. <laughs> we, we did so to avoid detection. And he was absolutely fuming, but he found it hilarious in, in later years. And I would remind him that the bully we Clyde will be okay next year, as we saw them last year, and they had a man at the back post at corner, so he's okay. <laughs> and I would thank him again for the, the, the discipline which we got, guidance, and even, even when that was to tell me I was no use as a player, and for all the laughs. And I would remind him that we were all so proud of him. 
He would want me to thank his great pals in the football community and others further afield for their friendship, support, loyalty and fun. And finally, um, I'd like to thank Dad's brothers Bob and Jock for all their help and support in the last few months in particular. And I was reminded at the crematorium that talent did miss a generation when Bob got up and spoke with no notes. Thank you, Bob. Aye, he was some man. Dad was indeed, as Hugh says, a great storyteller. And he loved an audience, especially a big audience. He'd have loved this. Dad would talk. It is a family thing. The problem was that at times it was difficult to get him to stop talking. I sometimes called in Dad to talk at coaching events through my work, and um, the boys from the SFA Southwest team will tell you, we would ask him to do a brief PowerPoint presentation followed by a practical coaching demonstration. One hour in, he was in slide two of the 55 that we'd prepared for him. <laughs> ask my dad to speak for five minutes, you get an hour. Ask him for an hour, and you get all day. He just wanted to share everything. We eventually managed to control him by just lying to him. Dad, I need you to do 10 minutes. Right, that's an hour, we've got an hour out of him, so it would be great. We'd, we'd lie to him all the time to get that. As the minister pointed out earlier on at, um, at the crematorium where the family were, um, Dad didn't let the truth stand in the way of a good story. He often misquoted people. Uh, shamelessly, he would say to me, um, as Sir Alec Ferguson often said, being powerful is to be like a lady. And I said, Dad, was that not Margaret Thatcher? <laughs> oh, it doesn't matter. It, it's, it's the same thing. It rings true. And then he would say, as Dick Campbell says, I'll, I'll bleep bits out. They cannot take away our respect if we don't give it to them. And I said, Dad, that was Gandhi. <laughs> no, no, I'm sure it was Dick. <laughs> he would quote Jock Steen, he loved Jock Steen, and he would say, Jock once said to me, Craig, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> and I says, that's from a Spider-Man movie, Dad. <laughs> no, definitely big Jock. He would far rather tell a beautiful lie than a boring truth. As Dad got older, he did become more than a wee bit repetitive. He armed himself with his tales of wisdom and wonderful stories. Some of them were even true. And those of us close to him knew them all by heart. So much so that his old comrades at the wee Wendy's pub on a Wednesday morning and the family close to him, we grew to knew these stories as buzzer stories. If you'd heard them before, you'd ring the buzzer. <laughs> so I've got exhibit A. <laughs> we, we bought him a buzzer for Christmas. <laughs> he was raging. <laughs> but a buzzer story would go something like this. Did I tell you the one about wee John Spencer sending us a postcard while we were on a flight? <laughs> and I went, buzz! What about Archie in the wheelchair football session that we did? <coughs> did I tell you the one about Ali McCoist and Graham Soonis? <coughs> Every time we buzzed him, he would just ignore you and continue and tell you the story anyway. He just wanted to talk. Dad's success with Scotland has been covered brilliantly by the TV, radio and print journalists recently. However, it's the stories behind the matches that seldom get mentioned and the trips of the Tartan Army foot soldiers um, have shared, you know, I, I, my own pals and I, the Presswick Tartan Army as we like to call ourselves, 
I've shared wonderful experiences and partaken in a shander too in many a far-flung city across Europe. Dad was always acutely aware of the time, commitment and money that the fans spent to follow Scotland and the other teams it was involved in. He was first and foremost himself, he was a fan. He loved football. He was always so very confident that Scotland were going to win. Whoever they were playing, playing Brazil, France, world champions, whoever. Ah, we'll win, they're, they're about weak at the back. They don't have a decent, don't have a decent centre back. Always positive about how they would win. He was supremely confident as well that Stevie Clark and Pedro Mendes Losa could ensure that the next generation of supporters will continue to follow Scotland to major finals on a regular basis. Nothing would make Dad happier. He firmly believed in the power of football and the wonderful positive impact it can have in all of our lives. When Dad first became Scotland manager, I was often really frustrated by the media perception of him, him as being this cuddly wee school teacher or some kind of soft touch. Those of us who know him well know this is far from the truth. He had a sharp tongue and occasionally a fiery temper behind the avuncular persona. He definitely had an edge, and I witnessed that edge as a teenager. Let me take you back to 1983, I think it was. Clyde, inspired by young Pat and Evan, were in the top of a bit of a cup run, and they'd beat Motherwell at Firth Park, and after extra time, 4-3, and get into the fifth round, I think it was the fourth or fifth round, they'd, they'd do Partick Thistle. First game ended in a draw, and those days it always went to a replay. Went to the replay, and near the end of the replay, the floodlights at Shawfield failed. Some of the boys might have been playing over there. I can see some of the stars there. The, the floodlights failed. Now they went back to another replay, and Clyde got an absolute doing. 6 1 or 6 nothing, I think it was. I remember a young Morris Johnson and Kenny McDowell up front were devastating for this at that time. Brilliant. The drive home in the car, in the back of the car, Dad's car that night was tense, to say the least. Dad drove in stony silence. Brother Hugh, Brains and Badger, our pals were in the back, all frightened to talk. I don't know if you remember, but after BBC Scotland radio shows back in the day, when that finished, when the football finished on a Saturday night, the country dance music came on. The guy Robbie, Sh Robbie Shepherd used to play Jimmy Shan tunes, all these old Scottish tunes. And that's playing in the car. We're all just sitting, face nobody's saying a word. And in my youthful naivety, I spoke above the cordon music and I asked my dad, Do you know, think you get our tactics a wee bit wrong today, Father? <laughs> tactics! Tactics! Don't you talk to me about effing tactics! Face was scarlet. So I didn't talk to him about tactics for many years after that. <laughs> I still get quite frightened every time I hear a dashing white sergeant or a drops of brandy, though. <laughs> As a, a postscript to Hugh's story about um, Dad not knowing who Kylie Minogue was, he came back after that show in at the house <laughs> and he said to me, Hi! That wee Australian lassie, it was very nice. She was naturally pretty and um, she had good chat. I'm sure she would probably do you or our Hugh, maybe. <laughs> I'm not sure whether it was Hugh or me she had in mind <laughs> when she wrote a hit song, I Should Be So Lucky. Dad's family were all academically inclined and education and learning were valued very highly. Every Christmas and birthday I would hint about getting an action man or a pen knife or the Holy Grail was a Skeletrix racing car set. Everybody wanted one, never got one. Instead, from our grandparents and our, our parents, we got encyclopedias, world atlases, a thesaurus, the Observer Book of Birds, anything educational. But amongst those and other books in our shelves growing up, I was lucky enough to find one of Dad's favourite books, and it was the collected poems of Robert Service. He's a Scottish poet, 
But service once wrote, the measure of our sunshine is the light that we can kindle in the eyes of others. And I love that. And I believe that that was what dad was truly best at. He kindled light in the eyes of others. He shared his sparkle with us all. So to wrap up my own storytelling and rambling, it is a family thing. I turned to another book that was in the bookshelf at home and it was a complete work of Robert Burns. Dad loved Burns, his intellect, his humanitarianism, his humor, his passion, and of course his magnificent storytelling. So I will leave you with the words of Robert Burns. An honest man lies here at rest, the friend of man, the friend of truth, the friend of age, the guide of youth. Few hearts like his with virtue warmed, few heads with knowledge so informed. If there's another world, he lies in bliss, and if there's none, he made the best of this. Well, I'm sure you'll agree that there's one skill and ability that hasn't missed a generation. The ability to tell a story, to amuse and entertain, but also to convey some great truths of a great man. And that's why we're here today, and it's particularly from the family that we hear the real heart of the man. And I'm sure that Craig would have been immensely proud of all the family, of all that you're able to do and all that you've become and uh, all through his strict discipline and guidance. But now we're just going to have a word of prayer together. Let's pray. Almighty and gracious God, as we bow in your presence, we are conscious that you alone are the creator of all things. You're the God who creates us. You're the God who sustains us. And you're the God who redeems us. And Father, we thank you for your goodness and love to us in so many ways. We thank you for the gift of life, for the ties that bind us together, the ties of family and of friendship and the bonds of love. To thank you especially today for the life of your child, Craig Brown. Father, we thank you for all that he was and all that he meant to us. We thank you for his growing years, for every good influence that was brought to bear upon him that made him the man that he was. We thank you for that long marriage that he shared with Joan for all that can be only within a married relationship, the growing together, the deepening of love and trust and understanding, for joys shared and hardships and difficulties faced and overcome together. We thank you for his skills and gifts and talents as an educator, as a football manager, for his life in sport. We thank you for good and happy and sweet memories. We thank you, Father, that he was someone who was part of our nation, who was recognized easily, who was admired and respected. We thank you for just who he was, that there was an openness, there was an expansiveness about his love, that he was always willing to share himself with others, to share experience and knowledge and time. Father, we thank you for the good and sweet memories that we will hold and share. We thank you for his great good humor, the banter, the crack, the ability to engage with so many folk. We thank you for good friends that shared with him. Father, we thank you for the very sound of his voice and the touch of his hand. Father, we do pray today for the family. We pray especially for Joan, thinking of her endless resilience, never f her never feeling love, her compassion. We pray for Val and Hugh and John, who have shared so many memories of their dad today. We pray too for the, the grandchildren, for Katie, Craig, Scott, Freya, Lucy and Robbie. We remember two brothers, Bob and Jock, for all the family. Father, whether near at hand or far away, we ask that you would draw near to surround them with your love and your comfort and your strength. 
Teach us to number our days. And may our lives more and more reflect the life of the one who said, because I live, you shall live also. Father, this prayer we present, along with our silent prayers, those of our hearts, in the strong name of Jesus Christ, to whom with you and the, the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, be ascribed all maj majesty and power, now and forevermore. Amen. We are coming near to the end of our, our service, our time here, and there's perhaps a few words of appreciation to be said. Joan and all Craig's family want me to express uh, upon their deepest appreciation for your attendance here this afternoon. Your presence, presence helps to comfort them as they get on with the business of life tomorrow and the moments of the memory and the times of readjustment that lie ahead. Our gratitude goes too to Barry Whelan and John Riggins of Barry Whelan Funeral Directors for their professionalism, for their warmth, for their care. Also, a word of thanks to Sharon and the staff here at Air Racecourse for their meticulous preparation of the Princess Royal Suite for us. To Matthew Hines, the organist from St. Columba's Air, who's provided the accompaniment both at Mason Hill and here. To the audio-visual unit of the Scottish Football Association for streaming the service and al allowing those unable to join us to participate and add their own recollections to the day. Upstairs in the function suite, afternoon tea has been organized for I think 350 people. Now, in looking around the numbers here, I'm not sure, but I think we might be over that limit. Maybe I should say if you're from Edinburgh, you'll have had your tea. <laughs> but it's been suggested um, that if you live nearby and you're likely to see the family in the near future, you might just nip home to Prestwick or Troon or wherever and put the kettle on and have your own time of remembering. Um, but I'm sure you'll perhaps just judge the cues, and uh, if they're too long, you'll make the correct decision. In Craig's memory, there are collection points today for three charities all connected with the illness which took Craig from us. The Ayrshire Hospice, which gives wonderful care to patients and their rel relations, to Ayrshire Cancer Support, which provides much needed transport to cancer sufferers to take them to and from the Beetson unit at the Garden Naval for treatment. And to Macmillan Cancer Support, providing nursing care for, for patients at home. Anything you give will be forwarded in Craig's name to these superb charities for, to further their work. Thank you so much in anticipation of your generosity. And so we bring our service here today to a conclusion by singing our final hymn, and this was a hymn that I think Craig learned when he was a wee boy, and you're to sing it with gusto. It's the final hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers, and we stand to sing.
every grace, mercy, and peace. From God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon and abide with each one of you, now and forevermore. said and give us some directions earlier on. It's been a long day. Um, if you're intending to stay for a cup of tea, then the way to go there is through the, the doors that are marked exit there and there. If you're not intending to stay for a cup of tea and you're planning to head off, then the exit is out that door there. So the, the, the signs that say exit will take you to the tea and coffee. That one there will take you out. Thanks very much. Thanks, Michael. Thank you.